Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the last talk today. And this is the second person we can announce that said, I have no clue what NEOS is all about, which is actually great because it's nice to look beyond the Tellerrand and uh, look outside our little NEOS bubble and get a perspective of someone who doesn't care about NEOS. So. When I read the title of the talk, I remembered a study that I had to deal with when I, in, when I was at university where I learned that if a website is pretty enough, users are, w are willing to forgive bad usability and bad performance. Elif is here to teach us how we can achieve both, maybe? Yes. <laughs> All right. So let's hear it. Thank We're you. We're very curious. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to my session. I know it's the last one. Maybe you're feeling a little bit tired. But because it's the last one, we should have nice energy, and then we can go out, party, and do our own stuff. So it's easy to create a good-looking product, but how about a useful one? OK, my name is Elisteria. I'm coming from Greece. Currently, I'm working as a community manager at Hashnot. Hashnot is a free blogging platform for developers. And feel free to connect with me with social, in social media. If you are too afraid to ask, uh, even in the app, your questions, again, feel free to find me on my social media, and I will do my best to answer you. OK, now let's get started. We will talk about UX and UI. What is UX? What is UI? What are the differences, the similarities? We will talk a little bit about heuristics. And then we will see some practical examples on how we can fix our products or how we can make them even better if we already have some products. And then I have two very quick sections with some tips and some advices and even some small tests that you can take them for yourself and see if you are a good or a bad designer. So let's start with some examples. <laughs> Who said washing your hands is always easy? Sometimes we want to be innovative, but that doesn't always work. <laughs> Elevators. Yeah, exactly. And I don't have any comment for this one. Yeah. But there are things that we, we know, and like this one. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have seen similar things. And I could go on with examples and more examples and more examples, but this is just uh, the introduction. And hopefully now in your mind, you already have some examples of things that you have seen either in the physical world, uh, world like the elevator or in your laptop. OK, now let's go to the theory. I know it's not the best part, but sometimes we need the theory in order to create something better, in order to prove something. Um, I will be talking, as I said, about UX, UI, and the similarities, the differences. And um, although there is a notion of content out there, you can Google it and you will find a lot of things. Here we will do something differently. We will cover these two terms from the perspective of the user and the perspective of the developer slash designer, because you are in both of this world. You are the user, but you are also the developer. And you may be thinking that you are only the developer. Maybe you are thinking that you are not the designer. But you're building stuff. And since you are building stuff, a lot of times you have to, to play the role of the designer. Even if you have a dedicated designer in your team or in your work, sometimes, again, you will have your opinion. And you will say, OK, this is better. This is not so good. It's nice to have some backup. It's nice to have some data and know why something works or why something isn't working. And uh, this is what we will try to do today. At, at least I'm an optimistic that we will achieve that in some level. OK, so I will start from the user perspective because it's a little bit easier. So user interface is what a user interacts with a product, what taps or, or clicks on. And the whole experience is localized in a device, maybe in a mobile device, maybe in our laptop, maybe in something else. But we will have a device. 
and user experience is how how the user interacts with the product and how a user feels after interacting with our product. The whole experience is localized in their body. So if we see someone holding an app and they are smiling, we can understand that something good is happening. But if they have like the face like this, maybe they are very severe, maybe we know that something isn't work as it should work. Okay, now from the designer's perspective, things can be a little bit more complicated, so I thought I could start with an analogy. When we see this big mountain, we actually see only the tip of it, but it's not only that. Underneath that, there is a whole bigger mountain, and there is the ice, and there is the cold weather that holds everything together. We may only see the tip, but it's not only that. That's actually the UI, the things that we can see, but beneath that we have the UX. And for us as developers or designers, these two things are connected. So from the designer's perspective, user interface is what you can see and interact with, and user experience is what you can see alongside with what you don't see and what holds everything together. So it's a big, big, big space. And UX has to do a lot with the ease and satisfaction of a product. It's a term that is always evolving, and if we try to give um, only one definition, it would be very, very difficult, because it covers a lot of things, and as technology um, moves, these terms, all, this term is also moving. So it can be subjective and objective. If it can be subjective, like does the user connect emotionally with the app? Are they cracking a smile? Are the icons and illustrations understandable enough? And is the user pleasantly surprised by animation or feedback, something like that? And on the other hand, it can be objective. Does the user accomplish what they want it to do? And is the speed of that satisfactory? Uh, is a swiping gesture or a tap more effective? All these things belong to UX, and more specifically, they can be objective. Now, let's see our first simple example. Would you prefer a writing sharing app, and I'm pretty sure that most of you are using apps like that, that it doesn't allow you to, fa to save your favorite destinations, it doesn't allow you to pick up your friends, it doesn't allow you to pay however you want, or would you prefer a very similar app, maybe the design is similar, but this time it lets you pick up your friends, save your favorite destinations, it shows um, the location of your driver in real time, your location in real time, and all those things. And yes, in this case, the answer is simple, I guess so, you would prefer the second app. But sometimes in our products, because we know them so well, we are developing them, we think that everything is optimized. And as we see them, that's how our users see them. But that's not always the case. You maybe do a quick uh, UI test in your app. Maybe, for example, you, you want to book some tickets. That's what your uh, app is doing, your product is doing. So you will very quickly tap here, here, here. You will pay, and that's it. But do you have a mother-in-law? Give them the same product. Is she going to do it that fast as you're going to do it? Maybe you have an ex-partner. Put them the same task. Are they going to do it as fast? And we want these people because these people are going to be tough with you. And in this case, we need that. We really need them. Because if you go to your team, your team will love you, and they will say, OK, everything is perfect. Or maybe they don't want to work right now, so they will say everything is perfect, okay, let's move on, let's go to the next feature. But it's not always like that. It's better to take some time, work on the things that we already have, be sure that it's working as it's supposed to work, test it with real users, not your team. Maybe your team is using the product, but they are not the real users, okay? Let's keep that in mind. 
So uh, why UX is important, I hope that by now we have understand that, uh, because at its core it's putting people before technology, everything has to do with people, with ease and satisfaction. It focuses on creating positive experiences for the users, and the result is a win-win situations for the company, for the people, for the users, really for everyone. Okay, and what does a UX designer do? I don't have a simple answer here, but even before that, let's go again to a quick history lesson. We have this man right here, he's Don Norman, and he's basically the pioneer of UX. He's the father of UX. He studied electrical engineering, but then he did a master's in psychology, and he was the first one that observed how people interact with tech products. The key word here is observe. And before him, obviously, people were using tech, uh, tech products, but after he came in the picture, everything worked better. And he actually works in Apple, and we have the Apple's design as we know it today. We go uh, based on his principles even today. He also has a lot of books. Uh, side note, we can find them for free on the internet. But he has some really, really, really nice books, and everyone can understand them. You don't have to be a designer, or you don't have to have like uh, special knowledge in order to understand the books. OK, back to my original question, which was, what does a UX designer do? He's doing a lot of stuff. I have here this pyramid. Um, we have five stages. I will start from bottom to top. We have user research and analysis, content strategy, information architecture, interaction design, and visual design. I also have a lot of details about these stages, but I'm sure you're not very um, interested about those stuff. I will quickly pass them. But basically, we need to have some research we need to have some findings, and only then we can move on to the next stages and on the next levels. And as a UX designer, you're never working alone. You have a lot of people around you. You have other researchers, you have developers, you have marketeers, um, you have, uh, I don't know, executive persons. You have a lot of people around you. So I will pass those uh, things. But again, you can have my presentation after that, and you can uh, read them on your own. So on the top two layers, we will talk about them in a bit. But here is where the UI designer uh, is going to come the picture. OK, we talked about UX. Let's go to UI, user interface. When we hear user interface, Again, I will guess that most of you think about colors, maybe images, OK? But I'm here to tell you that it's not only that. It's not only colors. It's not only images. Sometimes you maybe think of typeface, OK? It's not only that. We have many, many, many more things. This, for example, is UI. It's not your typical UI, but it's definitely UI. We have these small machines, and we can shout to them, and they will give us whatever information we may want. This is UI. And something that is more near to us as developers, this is also UI. We have, um, we have the terminal, and we don't have fancy colors there. We don't have fancy images. We don't have fancy typography. We will just type something, and we will get the results. This is also type type of UI. There are a lot of things, not only colors, not only images. OK, now that we get that, let's go to our question, what does a UI designer do? And again, I have the same pyramid, but this time we will have all the information from the previous uh, people and from their research and all these things. And this time, we will focus on the top two layers, the interaction design and the visual design. Yes, as I said, we will have the colors and the buttons and the typography, but the UI designer is a very, very skilled person. And he needs to have um, in his skill sets things like uh, visual hierarchy, alignment, layout, spacing, readability, and all those things. OK. Uh, and of course, let's not forget the different types of UI, even in our own devices. 
Okay, we know now the similarities and the differences about the UX and the, the UI. Very quickly, I will recap by saying that for, from the user's perspective, these two things can be different. We can understand them. In one case is what we see, and on the other case is what we feel. But as developers and slash designers, these two things are quite complicated, and we cannot have UI without UX. UI is part of the UX, and we really have to understand that. And not only us, but our bosses and our managers, they also have to understand that. Um, because when we see some applications, they will ask for a UI unicorn that they basically have to do everything, when in reality they mean that they want a researcher, or in reality they mean that they want a front-end developer. No. Okay, uh, let's move on to our second part, and soon we will see more examples. Let's talk about heuristics. Basically, heuristics is making decisions with the information that we already have. And I have a quote here that I really like. Good design is actually a lot harder to notice than poor design, in part because good design fits our needs so well that the design is invisible. And again, let's pause a little bit and try to think of when we see something that is nice, like a beautiful website, we will say, OK, that's a nice website. Or maybe we won't say anything because we will take it for granted. But when a website isn't working, we will say, OK, why it's not working? Why it's lagging? Why it's so slow? Why I cannot do that? I click here, but nothing happened. Why? To describe a bad website, I can do it like easily. I have many things to say. But for a beautiful website, usually I'm just going to say, OK, that's nice, or I'm not going to say anything. Again, just keep that in mind. Uh, we have numerous ways to evaluate something and try to understand if something is better or worse. But we will have, at least for today and for this session, we will go for the heuristic analysis, which is the last column you can see in this table. And basically, we will have 10 rules. I didn't think of these rules, of course not. Don Norman and uh, Jacob Nielsen did that in 1995. Again, we mentioned that um, uh, Don Norman is the one that works in Apple. But these two gentlemen are some great pioneers in this world. OK, let's start now with the 10 rules. The first one is visibility of system status. Again, try to, to imagine your phone. Right now, as soon as you will open it, the, the light will come on, and you will see some notifications, the date, the time, you know, the casual stuff. Now, imagine someone was taking all of them out of your phone. You didn't have time. You didn't have the dates. You didn't have the notifications. How would you feel? I know I wouldn't like it. The same goes for every product. Show to your users the, thing that they, uh, the things that they will expect from your product to be there. You don't have to show everything. We don't want that, but we want some basic information. And from there, they can always click on more, click on more information, and they will get the things that they want. But the first thing should be something simple. OK, I got this and this and this, and now I can move on. I can go deeper. OK, the second thing match between the system and the real world. People think that they know how something works based on the information that they have from other products. And that's quite OK, because it means that you don't have to be super innovative. You don't have to change everything. Of course, if you want, you can experiment with it. But don't try to change everything. For example, we know um, how copy-paste is. If you're using Windows or your Mac, you know what to do. If you, you have something similar in your product, don't try to change that, because people will just do that and they will realize that it's not working. And that's why I also have these images here, because when we first started working with tech 
uh, products. People presume that if they see a folder, it should be something like in real life. If they see a compass, it should be something in real life. That's how the skeuomorphism uh, design started. Now we have moved on from that, but some things still remain the, uh, the same. The third rule is user control and freedom. Every system should have a clearly marked emergency exit. Either we want it or not, our users will make mistakes. We shouldn't blame them, and we shouldn't think that we have the perfect product. We just uh, should give them an exit button, an undo button, uh, I don't know, a delete and recovery button, something like that. But we should always give them the freedom to go back, maybe to see something again, maybe to do something again. And these things are quite easy, right? It's not that hard to have an undo button. It's not that hard to have a back button or an escape button or something like that. It's just that we have to implement them. And the more we're implementing these kind of things, the happier our customers are going to be. OK, let's go to the fourth one, which is something that I really like. It's consistency and standards. Just because something is different, it doesn't mean that uh, it's useful. As I said earlier, yes, it's nice to be innovative, it's nice to have ideas, but don't try to change everything, and don't try to change ed everything at the same time. I gave you the example before with a copy-paste uh, and stuff like that. The same goes for your product. Some things are OK to be the same as in other apps. Uh, Something that we see very often is with colors. For example, somebody will decide to use a blue color, and that's OK. But every time then, you should be using the same blue. Don't change the, sa the sage, don't play with the same. Just keep that blue. Or if you have a um, delete button, use always the word delete. Not delete, not erase, not something else. Stick to one word. If you have icons, again, let's say for deleting, use the same icon all the time. If you're changing the icon, if you're changing the wording, it means that it's not the same action. But we want simple things, simple words, simple icons, simple whatever it is. Um, don't make your users think, and that's actually a title of a book, Don't Make Me Think. Okay. Let's move on to the fifth one, which is error prevention. We have two types of errors, the slips and the mistakes. When we have the slips, this is when our users will make some things wrong, uh, but maybe they are doing that because they are in a hurry, maybe they were paying attention, and that's OK. As we said in a previous rule, we will have that emergency exit, and they can go back and they can fix everything. That's OK, we covered that. But we also have the mistakes. And when we have the mistakes, here things are a little bit more critical. It means that the user is m doing something wrong because they don't understand what they need to do. And that's not their problem. This is the problem that we have to fix. We should go back. We should check the, the process or something, we should find that mistake and fix that. It's not always going to be easy. Probably you are not going to work alone. You will uh, work with other developers, other researchers, maybe again your uh, users, until you find that mistake and fix it. But it's quite crucial. And the sixth rule is recognition rather than a recall. Again, we have two types of memory retrieval. That's the recognition. The first one is the recognition, and the next one is recall. Every time in our products, we want the recognition. Recognition is when we really don't have to think. Again, we will see something, and we will know what we're searching for, what we're looking for, what we want to do next. Whereas recall is when we have to think about something. For example, a date. I don't remember dates. If I have to think about a date, that's not a good UX. But if, for example, I had two dates in front of me and I had to choose one of those two, that would be recognition and it would be way easier. And there are a lot of examples in that field in that field, especially when we have a search bar or um, if we have a big catalog of things. 
Um, I have here um, an example by Coursera because I really liked it. I don't know, it's quite old. I hope they haven't changed it. And I hope that you also implement something similar in your product. Okay, we have then flexibility and efficiency of use. We have different kinds of users. We have the first-time users, the people that are going to use our product for the first time, and we also have the power users, the users that they are working on our product every day and they know how things work. Now, we want to have things both from these types of users and, of course, for the users that are in the middle. Maybe the first-time users, they will need some documentation, some guidance. Maybe they will want to take their time and to find their things on their own time. But we also have the power users that, of course, they know how to use our product. These, things, these users want uh, different things. They want to do things fast. They want maybe to extend our own product. Maybe they want to connect it with something else. They want different kind of things. And we should be able to provide something for everyone. Sometimes we forget about our first-time users because we use our product a lot. Let's not do that. OK, and let's go to the eighth one, which, again, is one of my favorites, is aesthetic and minimal design. Oh, God, we have seen a lot of ugly products. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one, OK? Uh, we have seen some websites with a lot of colors or a lot of animations or a lot of things are moving up and there or they have too much text and we cannot read everything. We have to scroll down and down and down until we find something and... No, OK, tell me I'm not the only one who observed these things, right? <laughs> OK, if I had to give you a few tips here, if you are developing your product, your website, whatever you are doing, and you are not a specialized designer, then I would suggest you going with only a couple of colors, maybe black and white, or there are more colors that you can use, but don't try to have uh, like 10 different colors and then 10 different shades. Just stick to one or two colors and trust me, it will be fine. Uh, the next tip is don't use too many animations and uh, you don't have to use any animation at all, but if you want to use something, okay, maybe one max two and that's okay. And the third thing is use a bigger font family, uh, like font size, because when you're using that small letter, we cannot read them. We are not 20 anymore, okay? Thank you. Uh, help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. Uh, again, I pretty much talked about that. Our users will make mistakes, either we want it or not. Uh, now let's help them find the right way. I have here an example that um, I like. I mean, the second one, not the first one with the error, <laughs> because even if you are a developer, probably you won't be able to understand that. So let's go to the next one. Let's say that our user is going to upload a PNG, but we won't accept PNGs in our system. We can say, OK, you try to upload a PNG. I cannot take PNG. Try with another format. I accept that and that. Or even better, I can have a panel for the upload, and I can say I only accept that and that. So in that case, our user won't even do the first mistake. Always think about that. And the last one, the last, uh, let's say, rule is help and documentation. Yes, we do want to have the perfect product, but, and we want to have like users that they will know how to use our product, but because we have the first time users or because we have the more experienced user that they will want some more advanced stuff, that's why we want the help and the documentation. For the documentation, I don't mean that you should have like lengthy articles or lengthy text, or you should be using like a very um, high-level terminology. No, just keep it simple, and everyone will understand it. Everyone will be able to work with it. And uh, you really don't need a lot. I have here an example with Trello, but uh, Slack and other apps are doing a great work at that. They will have some small pop-ups with small sentences, and you will very quickly know how to use those products. Okay, 
And that were the rules, okay? We're done with that. Let's move on to the next part, which are the do's and don'ts of UX. We will, again, see very, very quickly this time some tips for the researchers. Let's start. Don't assume you know what your users want. No, as we said earlier, we are not the users. We are the developers and the designers. Yes, we use the product, but we are not the users. We have our test users. And um, sometimes people ask me, OK, but my company doesn't have users. That's OK. You can go out on the street and find people and ask them, or if you are having a more um, difficult audience, let's say, again, you can use some online platforms and you can say, I want this type of users, can you find me? And they will find you. Of course, you will have to pay something, but it's doable. Okay, don't follow the hippo at the room, hippo hide paid person's opinion. Yes, your boss is paying you, but they don't pay you because they want to hear that, okay, everything is great and everything works fine. No, you have an opinion, now you know how to back it up, you know how to find the data. Okay, say what you have to say. Do make the time and effort for user research, that's where everything should be starting. Don't just create a list of methods to check off, think outside of the box too. And don't prototype too soon. Okay, I need to fix that. Do focus on what people do rather than what they say, and that's why we said that we should observe how people interact with our product. Don't only, for example, ask questions um, in a type form or something, because they will give you answers, okay, but really observe them in real life, how they're using your product. Are they happy? Are they moving fast? What are they doing? Are they scrolling somewhere that they shouldn't scroll? What are they really doing? These things you can only find if you observe them. If you can only do one thing, do contact user testing. And don't overlook existing insight from customer care representatives. If you have a support system, if you have someone that is working on the support, go there, uh, maybe work there a little bit for yourself. See the tickets, see what's wrong, see what people think about your product. I actually did that a few months ago for my company. and. I thought that everything was fine, but in reality, it wasn't like that. A lot of people had things to say that I'm, I'm working all the time there. I didn't see them, but the others saw them. And it was very important for me to see those things, understand those things, and then go back and fix them. So if you have the opportunity to work maybe a little bit for a couple of days with a support team, do that. You will find things that you didn't think before and do collaborate, you're never alone. Do find someone qualified to do your research or become one by yourself, and I hope that with this session you're a little bit more qualified. And now let's move on to the next part that you can test yourself. Uh, we will talk about the good UI designer and the bad UI designer, and you can pick your side. Before I do that, I have another quote that I really like. A good designer is not the one who designed beautiful, usable, impressive interface. The main difference that sets apart a good designer from a bad one is the mindset. And actually, uh, the next slides are about the mindset of a good and a bad UI designer. Let's start. The good UI designer listens to everyone from decision makers, team members, and stakeholders, whereas the bad one judges and suggests solutions all the time. You can pick your side. The good one questions the status quo and digs deep to find out real problems and needs, whereas the bad one follows the rules. We've always done it that way. That's a very classic one. And tries to fix symptoms only. The good one takes time to ask about what is missing and is always uncertain about their understandings of, and the designs, whereas the bad one follows their assumptions and is always certain about their work. The good one has many solutions and ideas and tries always to find issues and flaws on their work, 
whereas the bad one has only one idea to invest their time to convince everyone that they are right and always defends their work. The good one loves to be wrong and seeks feedback, whereas the bad one loves to be always right and seeks praise. The good one leads, the bad one follows. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'll gladly take them. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Elif. In case you're surprised, um, we're doing a girl show now. Christian had to leave, he's preparing the uh, award show. Um, but I think we'll manage. Um, shockingly, this is the fullest the room has been all day. Woohoo, thank you guys! <laughs> but none of them have submitted a single okay. question. <laughs> but okay. Okay. I have questions. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, is there an intersection or an overlap or a distinction between user interfaces and user experience and the entire concept of accessibility? Uh, yes. Good. Because, <laughs> because UI and UX are connected and uh, we couldn't have UI without UX, mm -hmm. but you mentioned accessibility and I, I'm not working in that field, so I don't have a lot of things to comment on that, mm -hmm. but we should always take care of that as well. Okay, and what is your, like, your number one example of bad UX that you encounter all of the time? I think it's the one that I mentioned, like not all the time, but it's the one that I mentioned that people are trying to be creative and they will use a lot of colors, a lot of, uh, a lot of images, a lot of animations, and in the end you won't be able to do the thing that you wanted to do because you will get distracted by the animations, the different colors, the different buttons, and this type of things. All right, I'm not checking my text messages. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. So, whoop, because a question came in. I tried to like buy them some time. <laughs> Two questions came in. You guys delivered. <laughs> All right. What do you think about over self-designing of younger people on social media? Whoa. Uh, over? Over self-designing of young people on social media. Uh, Does the person that asked the question want, maybe want to clarify? No? Uh, I'm not sure uh, what you mean, but if you mean like uh, over showing themselves, I would say that uh, uh, until, at, until one point that's okay, because that's why we use social media, because we usually want to promote ourselves, we want to promote what we are doing, but when we overdo it, I don't like it, but also I'm not sure if I answered your question because I'm not sure if I got it correctly. I didn't ask the question, I just extended it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the second one's very interesting though. Um, what if I integrate a well-known third-party product? Is it better to leave it as is because the users are used to it like that? Or should I fit it in with the rest of my product? That's indeed a good question. Um, I would say it depends. If you have uh, the time and uh, you think that you can integrate it in a beautiful way, I would say yes, because we want consistency. And if I go to my app and then I see um, the third app, I will say, okay, why are these two things differently? So if, if you can do it in a beautiful way, then yes, do it. But if you don't have the means of doing it, then go ahead and use uh, what there is already out there. All right, last question that rolled in is how slash where will your presentation be available? I will share it in a bit on that Twitter. <laughs> Woo! Jesus, you guys. Um, how often did you get into a fight with a developer because of the design is over-designed? Well, <laughs> <laughs> now they know how I work, so it's a bit better. But when you start to work in a new team and they have to learn you and your needs and what you're going to ask next, then it can be a little tough, but nowadays it's okay. All right, one last refresh. Nope, we're done. Elif, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.